So if you asked me if I prefer to be the favorite or to be the underdog, I'm going to choose the underdog every time. And that's not just because I enjoy proving people wrong, which I think I probably enjoy a little more than I should. If I was honest, though, I prefer being the underdog as a coach because I'm so bad at being the favorite that the outside expectation to win a game or to even like be the best team in the conference that season, I've really struggled throughout my career at managing these expectations and helping my team to manage those expectations. So in today's episode, we're going to talk about how to coach your team when winning is expected. Nate's a lot better at this than I am as a coach, so he'll be sharing some of his insights, and I'll be sharing some of my insights into the coaches that I've worked with and supported who've managed this well, in my opinion, since I've been traditionally bad at it. Welcome to the Coaching Culture Podcast, the podcast where we're all on a journey to become better leaders and build stronger team cultures. I'm joined by my co-host and buddy, Nate Sanderson. If you find this podcast helpful, well, you'll probably find our weekly newsletter and online courses helpful as well. Head on over to tocculture.com, subscribe to the newsletter and check out those courses. I promise you they aren't your usual boring coach development courses that you have to take to get uh, your coaching license. They are actually super practical, simple, well-organized, if I do say so myself. All right, Nate, you're way better at coaching your team when you're expected to win. So what do you got for us? JP, before I dive into some specific things that we've done with some teams in the past to put some of those expectations in perspective and try to just frame them in a way that our team can move forward without, you know, experiencing some of the just the negative consequences of the expectation to win. I I think it's important for coaches to understand that it isn't just being preseason number one or the conference favorite, but you know, when you bring a 500 team back right with almost all your players back like that there's going to be expectations that come with that shoot sometimes you win five games but you bring everybody back you know and everyone thinks that all of a sudden you're going to double that win total like it, it isn't expectations don't just come from a preseason ranking we can all feel the weight of that you know and sometimes it's this team has been really good in middle school jp so of course they're going to be great in high school so i, I think broadly speaking as a coach you know we want to start to think about how can we insulate our teams from being affected by whatever expectations are sort of thrust upon them from the outside and even sometimes from the inside when players carry those own their expectations for you know how things should go in a particular season i do think that you know the way that we approach a couple of those years being preseason number 1 can be instructive in how you might go about that particularly as you're starting a season so just a little backstory for our listeners here in 2015 um, we kind of made this Cinderella run to the state tournament. We ended up being runner up. We lost in the championship game. And the following year, we bring everybody back except our senior captain and starting shooting guard. She was our leading scorer, 1,000 point score in her career. But everybody else, you know, was back. And so we're preseason number one that following year with a really young team that's made up mostly of, of sophomores and at our core. And so we started that season with the conversation about what does that mean to be preseason number one? And the way that we did it is we looked at two things. Number one, we asked this question of, you know, what did we learn from last year's experience that can be instructive for us this year? Like we made it to the summit, you know, we got to the mountaintop, we got to the last game of the year, we didn't finish. So what do we learn from that journey, right? And we looked at an example, I told the story, our team and showed some video, of the Spurs when, you know, they lost the championship in game six on the Ray Allen three-pointer in the corner, they go on to lose in overtime and then they lose game seven and they had, you know, the championship in their fingertips and they lost it. And what did Popovich say going into the following season to get his team to rebound from that disappointment? He said, essentially, we have to find a way to be just a little bit better at what we do. And so we use that message to communicate to our team that, you know, we know the journey to the top of the mountain. We just have to be a little bit better at the things that we do because, and this is one of the things that we would leverage with that preseason ranking or those expectations is that what we do works. You know, we started with that assumption that the things that we did last year got us where we wanted to go. We know they work. 
We just have to be a little bit better at doing those things to try to finish off the deal, you know, in that season. Nate, what I love about that is I think it touches on what I think would be my advice for coaches in these type of situations, which is trying to get the team to find the joy in improvement and just consistently getting better, like which was Pop's, you know, focus. So we just got to focus on getting a little bit better, you know, each day. And as we move through this journey, I think winning a lot of, of games is a really great experiment and, and it reveals a lot about how the game and our team and everything has to be more than just winning, right? Like, cause you see these teams that are like winning lots of games they are undefeated. And a lot of times they're, they're not happy. Yeah. They're just afraid of actually losing. They're afraid of the streak being ended. It just adds all this pressure and expectation. And so for, I, I think for teams approach a season of high expectations, they're, they need to focus on their joy in the journey, not be even necessarily the joy of winning lots of games, but the joy of just constantly improving and bettering ourselves, right? Because if we're only focused on the joy on the journey coming from the winning games, I think that the fear of losing will eventually overpower that, you know, and it will kind of ruin that. So it's just that joy of improvement. I think every coach should really be focused on. And I have to say, the other thing I really liked about, you know, your approach there, Nate, is that you kind of just talk about the thing I think a lot of people just kind of want to like sweep on the rug and not talk about. You know, I think I've avoided the conversation and expectations because I didn't want my team to think differently about a game or a season. I'm just like, no, we're coming in here. We're focused on the process, right? But you've started to like not sweep it under the rug. You're starting to say, hey, this is something we need to talk about because this is a reality. It's in the back of your minds. And there's definitely a narrative going around the team, you know, around these expectations, right? Yeah, for sure. And I I think that approach, you know, is is just stolen from Dr. Perry, who talks about trying to make potential stressors predictable, right? So one of the ways, the second part of our conversation when we were preseason number one was just talking about what does that mean? You know, and I remember sitting in the classroom and putting a line down the middle of the whiteboard and saying, what are the advantages of being preseason number one? And what are the disadvantages, right? And on the advantages side, you know, just getting kids to brainstorm like, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, number one, it means you probably are pretty good. You know, like I said before, it's a, it's a acknowledgement that what we've done to this point seems to be working. So hopefully that builds into our confidence a little bit. You know, I think that uh, when you're number one and there's a little bit more media attention and, and there's more buzz in the community and maybe there's more people coming to games, all those things are more fun. I'd rather play in a gym with fans than a, you know, a gym with 25 people that are all just the parents of our players, right? So, you know, there, there's advantage to that. Um, I think that when you're the favorite, you know, or, or people expect you to win, that oftentimes your opponent's breaking point will happen sooner in a game. You know, there's, there's typically a point where the score gets to a certain place and you can just feel the other team realizes they can't win. And I think when you're the favorite, that happens sooner than than maybe when you're not that that point where they lose hope, you know, in the outcome. That's an advantage, you know. And so there's lots of advantages to being preseason number one that we don't necessarily recognize because a lot of times we just perceive that as pressure, right, and expectation. The other side of it is that there are negatives potentially that can affect your team when those expectations come in, and we talked about those. So we brainstorm what. What's the negative of being preseason number one? Well, everybody expects you to win, right? There's more pressure. Uh, you're going to get sometimes everybody else's best you know, shot because there's a target on your back and they've got nothing to lose. They're playing without any pressure at all because you're number one. You should win every game that you play. So the other team gets to play with a little more freedom, right? They get to be the underdog that you talked about uh, a little bit before in the, in the opener. And so just acknowledging those things and brainstorming them and getting a chance to look at them. And then again, closing that conversation by saying, let's embrace the things that come with expectation. And then let, we'll have a dialogue. We'll continue to work on how do we handle, you know, facing everybody else's best shot or the pressure that comes along with that preseason ranking. Yeah. I love how you're talking about the negatives there, because I think the hardest loss for a team to experience are the ones that you're expected to win. Because when you lose those games, what happens, you know, everyone starts asking questions, you know, like, have they lost it? You know, are they in a rut? You know, how could they blow that? You know, like, it's just, 
there's a lot more criticism. People start to question each other. They start to question themselves. You know, it just, it can start to break a team down if you're not careful. So I think it is trying to get your team to prepare for those storms and that the reality is everyone can lose on any given night, you know, but not even just that, but it's just like, it's just creating this expectation of those storms are going to come. How are we going to respond in those moments? I, I think that that's, that's critical rather than maybe messing with that whole goal of like the undefeated season or how long we can keep this, this streak alive. Uh, I think I, I remember working with a coach last year and they were on this unbelievable longest win streak in the school's history. Uh, if I'm right. And the pressure started to build to the point where like, they weren't talking about it, you know, like, it's like, Oh my gosh, you know, when's it? but everyone felt it. And finally he, you know, he just sat him down. He had the conversation like, this is going to happen. How are we going to handle it as a team when it happens? And believe it or not, two games later, they played a really good team. They lost. But it didn't derail their season. They just went through it. They learned from it. They didn't make a big deal out of it. Whereas they walked out of the locker room and the parents and the community is like, oh my gosh, it's over. It's over. Like, yeah, well, we were prepared for this. You know, we talked about this. This would come. So I think normalizing those losses, uh, you know, I think that's a huge piece of it as well. And here's another way, JP, to kind of put those preseason expectations into perspective. And again, whether that's, you're expected to be over 500 for the first time, or you're going to be ranked or a conference favorite, whatever it might be. I remember when, when uh, the, the newspaper, you know, was kind of the first poll to, to put us in that top spot in our class in the state. And when we, we talked a little bit about this, like, well, what does that mean? And, and I asked, you know, how many times has Jeff Linder seen us play this year, this year's version of our team? How many times has he seen us play? They sort of looked at me puzzled because it was the preseason. We'd had one week of practice. We hadn't had any games. And they're like, well, he hasn't seen us play. I'm like, well, you're right. How many times has he seen the other 14 teams that are ranked in the preseason play? Well, I haven't seen their, you know, them play either. Right. So, so this is just his guess. You know, I have no idea how good we are going to be because I've never seen this iteration of our team play either, you know? And so in some ways, you're you're contextualizing some of those predictions it's the same thing with a parent expectation you know you come into a season you were 500 last year they think you're going to be great and win the conference and go to state this year because you bring everybody back how many of those parents you know how many people in our community have seen every other team in our league play that and know what's coming back none of them right and so in some ways you're just trying to plant the seeds that maybe these predictions aren't fully informed you know because we don't really have enough information to know what this season is actually going to look like. And I think that was really good for us just to deflate a little bit of that pressure because we haven't seen ourselves either, right? And nobody really knows until the games start to happen. Now, I think related to that point is this question of, as a coach, you know, do we have any influence over the outside perception or expectations that might be around our team for that particular season? And in some ways we do, and in some ways we, we don't. One of the things that I've leaned pretty heavily into this year at Mount Vernon, because I have no idea what our ceiling is, to be honest with you. We've been playing better than what I expected, maybe going into the season. But, but I don't want people going into the second half of our year thinking, oh, we got to win you know, 10 games or 15 games to make this year a success. So we've really worked hard in our weekly email to frame both our upcoming opponents and the week gone by. So every week when I send an email on Monday morning, I look at our opponents, upcoming opponents, and really try to frame them in a way of, you know, like we play a team tonight that's five and six, we're five and six, but they haven't been blown out by anybody. They've been in every game. They're making games tough. They play really hard. Like they're a really good opponent, even if their record doesn't necessarily reflect it. And so I I don't want people coming in and just thinking, oh, well, we're averaging so many points a game. We should blow these guys out. I know that's not reality as a coach. So I'm trying to share that, you know, with our players and with our parents and the people that read that weekly email, here are the challenges associated with every team that we play during the week. Then a, a second part of our email is looking back at the week gone by and just talking about growth. You know, and the thing that you mentioned before trying to emphasize, we're really about trying to get better, trying to use every game as an opportunity to learn about ourselves, learn where we need to improve, and then to acknowledge when that improvement takes place. So last week, we only played one game. 
won a road game by 10 points. It was a nice win. We played a really complete game. But the improvement that we saw sort of under the hood that maybe other people don't see is that you know, we didn't allow any transition points for the first time all year. And that was big for us because that means one, we're taking better care of the ball and two, we're doing a better job in our transition defense responsibilities. Those are the little process oriented things that we're paying attention to. If we would have lost that game by six, I probably would say the same thing. We lost the game, but here's what we did well compared to what we were doing say a month ago. And so in all of that, we're just continuing to try to frame the conversation around each game. Here's the challenges that you may not see. Here's the improvements that we're making that you may not see to try to influence how people are perceiving our team. You know, Nate, a team that I really admire that has handled this expectation really well this year is St. Paul's uh, out of New Orleans. Uh, they're just done a phenomenal job last year. They were runners up at the state championship. What I think they do so well as a team and managing these expectations is they just focus on what makes them great, right? They, they know they have a real strong team identity, a way they're going to play. They're not caught up in having like a bulletproof game plan every day. It's just like, this is what we need to do to be the best team that we can be. And they're comfortable knowing that they can still lose with that. Like they know how they want to lose as well too. Like, if we don't shoot the ball well, we will probably lose. We understand that, right? That's part of our game plan. But we're going to go focus and we're going to focus our energy on shooting well and, and doing all the things that we need to do to be the best team that we can be. And I think there's that part of that process stuff that you talk about that's, that's so key. But when you're at that place where you can just start to really be confident in your team's identity and what makes you great and keep your focus on that and continuing to improve in those things, I think that helps in a big way. Well, JP, I think related to that, you hear a lot of coaches, and Matt Campbell has said this at Iowa State, Nick Saban said this before the, the national championship game here last week, that they're just trying to be the best versions of themselves, right? Like they have an identity of who they are, of how they want to play, of how they want to play offense and defense. And the goal is to just to do that to the best of our ability and whatever happens, happens. And I think sometimes as coaches, that's our mindset, but we don't necessarily flesh out what that means. Maybe we do with our players, but not necessarily to, you know, the other stakeholders in our, in our program. I think about our team this year, we've kind of found a way forward. If we're going to win games, we have to take great shots we have to make some, right? We got to get a lead early and then we got to protect the ball and rebound late. And that's our path. Like that's the way that we can beat good teams. We get behind early. We just don't have a way to turn people over, right? So we, we just know, you know, playing from behind is going to be difficult for us. And there's lots of examples. You know, the Patriots would say the same thing. Like when they're ahead and they can run the football, that's how they're going to win. They get behind, they're in big trouble, you know? And so I think just acknowledging that, uh, can be an important step. Just to everybody understands here's what we're trying to do and why we understand our vulnerabilities, but I think it allows people to embrace the formula for success, even if it doesn't look like what maybe they expected going into the season. You know, the funny thing, Nate, about all this is you can go into a season being the underdog, but as soon as you start winning some games and playing some good basketball out there, people's expectations can start to build up pretty quickly. And all of a sudden people start to think, oh, wow, we could, we could be really something. We could go far, you know? And all of a sudden, then you're, the next moment you're in, you're playing, you know, another really talented team. There's a lot of expectations for you guys to continue your strong play. Uh, and this game becomes big time. You know, there's a bigger crowd. There's bigger focus. There's a lot more pressure that is being put on you and the players. So, so how should coaches start to approach those type of games? Well, JP, I just had this conversation with one of the coaches in our mentorship program last week, and th their team has kind of gradually climbed the rankings throughout the season, found their way at number one here this week, and is going into the biggest rivalry game on their schedule tonight, in fact. Um, Crosstown rival, another really, really good team in the state. The players don't like each other very much. The fans don't like each other. And, and it's going to be a totally different environment and they're going to be the favored team, maybe for the first time in the last few years in the game. And so what I recommended was for him to, again, just kind of use the same approach and just talk about how is this game going to be different 
than any game that they've played this season. You know, the rivalry has always been really strong. There's always been a big crowd. And some of the upperclassmen in this program have experienced that in the past. And so we start there having them kind of share their experience of how is this rivalry game different? There's more people there. There's more vitriol, you know, between the teams. It's really, really loud. It's hard to hear your coaches. You're, you know, you're harder each other on the, on the floor. And so they're just trying to describe the environment and again, make those stressors predictable. So we know what we're walking into. Then I think to undo some of the fear of losing, like, well, what happens if we lose? Then we're not number one anymore. And, you know, this team beat us. And how does that affect our seating in the postseason? And sometimes that fear, the, the fear of what could happen if we lose a big game can trigger some of that fight or flight during the game when things aren't going well that make it more difficult to play, right? And so again, we just talk about it. Like what happens, and this is what I've, I've done with teams in the past, draw a line on the board, on the left side, what happens if we win? And on the right side, what happens if we lose? You know, and just trying to acknowledge if we win, okay, we solidify our seating and, you know, we're going to be number one and there's going to be even more hype and, you know, it's going to be, Great victory over opponent, you know, blah, blah, blah. So there's lots of great things that come from winning, but we're trying to undo some of the catastrophic, quote unquote, consequences of losing the big game. What happens if we lose? Well, we're still protected in the seedings. We're probably not dropping that far in the conference. We still have a chance to go to the state, you know, state tournament. This team is going to reveal to us areas where we need to get better, probably more than other teams that we're going to play. Because when we make mistakes, they're going to put them on the scoreboard. We're going to feel those mistakes when they turn into points. And so we're trying to embrace the feedback that we're going to get from that team that's well coached and has good players that maybe they don't get from playing a lesser opponent at a different time during the year. So at the end of the day, we're trying to value the experience of the game. Number one, by saying this environment is unique. We know it's going to be different. But it's also pretty special. Like, you don't get to play in front of crowds like this very often. Let's enjoy it. You know, this is what's great about rivalry games. Let's make sure we enjoy the experience and win or lose. We know that there's value and there's benefit for us on the other side of this game. I think that name it to tame it, you know, naming the fears and the stressors is huge. Followed up with a pro continued, you know, similar process for how you would approach any other game. You know, I think there has to be that transition of, okay, we've named it, tame it. We're moving past it. We're going to enjoy this moment. At the same time, we've got those processes in place. You know, when it comes down to setting success criteria for the game, knowing, you know, what their strengths are and how they could beat us down to knowing where they're weak and how we can exploit those weaknesses. And number one, knowing what we need to do to be our very, very best, most importantly. So I think just coming back to that and having those processes in place is absolutely critical. But I just love how you, you know, embrace the moment where I've probably in my career have run from the moment. And so let's not talk about the fact this is just like any other game, which is, in all honesty, it hasn't worked out for me so well over the years. Well, I think what's funny about that, JP, is oftentimes as coaches, we say, oh, the basket's still 10 feet off the ground, right? And the free throw line is still 15 feet away. And we, we make this great speech about how it's just another game. And then the film session is twice as long. The scouting report is seven pages instead of one. Every outbounds play is drawn up. Practices are longer. We got to shoot around. We haven't done that before. You know, everything else that we do as a coach, we're nervous. We're dressed up maybe a little bit differently, you know, and, and so our actions communicate this game, this opponent is totally different from every other one that we've had so far this season, but we expect our players to approach it the same way. Like there's got to be a little bit for us about trusting the process that's worked against other opponents and not getting too carried away and not giving in to, you know, the fear of, well, geez, if they score on these two out of bounds plays, let's keep them 10 minutes longer, you know, and practice that sort of thing. Because as coaches, we want to, you know, make sure that we look under every rock but we haven't always done that all year long, you know? And so I think that consistency is really important, not just in the speech, but also in the process and the approach we have to the game as coaches. Yeah. And I think all this is a really tricky balance to strike because the reality is we're acknowledging the game is different. The stage is bigger. People are watching it. We're identifying the stressors, stressors but at the same time, I think we're trying to encourage coaches to like oftentimes I'm on calls and a coach might say, oh, we've got a really big one today. And I'm thinking in my head, okay, it's a big one, 
but is that going to impact your emotional state within the game? And oftentimes, I know me as a coach, if I felt like the game was really, really big, the second thing started to go poorly, my reactions were really, really negative because I expected us to win or I felt that pressure to win. Whereas if, you know, we're going into a game and the expectations aren't as high and the stage isn't as big, my reactions aren't as dramatic. You know, I can probably stay the course and stick to my process. So I think while we acknowledge it, where we're encouraging coaches to acknowledging it's a big game, right? There's a lot of expectation here. At the same time, we have to be, you know, that steady force within our team that continues to focus and prepare and focus in the process. And, and I just, you know, I laugh at myself because there was, you knew it was a big game for Coach Nurbin when he wore the, the gold blazer. Like if the gold blazer came out, oh boy, you know? And then if things weren't going well, you knew the blazer was being torn off in the first minutes, you know? So and we just have got to be a little bit more even keel for our team. I think our example is absolutely critical. Well, I think related to that, JP, you know, a lot of times in big games or games where the, both opponents are pretty good, there's a lot of ebb and flow to the game. There's shifts in momentum. And sometimes we can overreact to a bad stretch. You know, I remember being at the state tournament in, in a semifinal game one year and we played really well in the first half. And I think we were up 16 at halftime or something like that. And we were playing a great team. And, and you know, we knew that they were going to make a run in the second half. I mean, there's, they're just too good to, you know, get buried by 30 or something like that. And so we talked about that in the locker room. We said, look, this team is going to redouble their efforts. They have nothing to lose. They're trailing. They're going to come out. They're going to be more aggressive. They're going to shoot it with more freedom. And if they go on a run, that's to be expected. But here's the thing about that it takes a lot of energy to climb out of a 16 point hole. And what are they going to have left if they get themselves back in the game to finish it? You know? And so sure enough, we go on the second half, they bomb in a couple threes, all of a sudden a 16 point lead gets down to 10, then to eight, you know, we take a timeout, we settle down and we just said, look, we expected this, but do they have enough left and what do we need to do to finish? And sure enough, you know, they kind of ran out of gas and we stretched the lead back out and won it comfortably late, but we didn't overreact when things started going in the other direction, we, we prepared our players for that and, and we just handled it, you know, very calmly. And it was good for our team, I think, to prepare them for that rather than like what you're saying, do some kind of strip tease on the bench and throw chairs and stuff around, you know, and, and increase the level of anxiety that, oh my God, we're going to throw this thing away. No, 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 no. We, we know how to win with a six point lead, just like we do with a 16 point lead. Let's go do that. You know, Nate, now that you're mentioning all of this, it makes me think about a phrase that I really, really feared as a coach when I would hear someone on the team say, we shouldn't be losing to these guys. Like when I heard that, I'm like, oh gosh, we're done. Like, because we're in this mentality of like the pressure and the expectation is getting to, we're better than this team. How can we be playing this bad? And it's like, no, 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 you've forgotten that, they, you know, they have a vote as well here. Like they, they can be playing well. We can be playing poorly. Every team can lose. Right. But as soon as I heard that, like I was really honestly, I would get fearful because I was like, we have the wrong, wrong mindset and we're allowing expectations to impact our performance. When I heard a player and I've, I've been guilty of saying it as well to my team, we shouldn't be losing to these guys. But when we've said that, we're really honestly, we might be done. I'm glad you brought that up, JP, because I think that can be a temptation because we certainly think it. And we certainly feel it on the sidelines as a coach and probably our players do. And you can get that vibe from the stands as well. But introducing that into a huddle only makes your players more likely to experience that fight or flight, that anxiety and that pressure. And then, you know, they start to overreact and they aren't able to be as creative and connect and all those kind of things that lead to better play. You're almost short circuiting that process whenever we insert those expectations into the middle of a game. So I appreciate you bringing that up. I want to touch on one more thing here before we wrap this episode up. And that is, you know, we talked about expectations for the season. We've talked about expectations for a specific game. What about for individual players when they're coming in and there's expectation on them to, to play great, or they feel that individual burden, you know, that they need to play at a certain level, whether it's to give your team a chance to win, or, you know, they're just carrying that as being the preseason player of the year, or, you know, or something like that. And I think the one piece of advice that I would give coaches, if you're working with individuals that really feel that, you know, that anxiety and that individual pressure, 
is to keep coming back to and keep having conversations, whether it's with them one on one or it's with your team um, in general, on what makes it fun to be us. How do we find enjoyment in the way that we play, in our process, and how we prepare, and what happens in the locker room before the games, you know, and how we celebrate after the games? If you can get more perspective and get players to focus more on how they enjoy being part of this team or playing with their teammates, it provides a bit of a distraction for that individual player and gives them something to focus on to enjoy the moment. Like it's different than just saying, go out there and enjoy it, you know, be present. Well, players don't know how to do that. But if you say, tell me what is most fun about being part of this team, you know, and they say, oh, I just love it how my teammates celebrate. Then tonight, go out and celebrate your teammates. Now I'm giving them something to focus on, right? Something specific that changes their attention from, I got to go out and score this many points. I got to carry the team to something that's easily controllable that they can experience and undoes a little bit of the burden that they might feel in that particular game. I've noticed in my own experience as a player, and then, you know, as a coach as well, Nate, that when a player plays really, really well in one game, there becomes this expectation, right? To have a really, really good follow-up game. And, and that expectation grows and grows and grows as they play well. And that, ex- that those expectations and the pressure grows often be times because everyone around that player is praising that player for their outcomes. You know, they drop 30 points, they score five goals or whatever it is. Wow, you're unreal. Like, and it's like, oh, now the pressure is on to go and have that repeat performance. And usually it's really hard to string back, you know, back to back unbelievable games because th- that player starts listening to all the people around them. So I think us as a coach have to be really intentional when a player plays well one game to not lavish them with praise to focus more on affirmations and to really reflect with them. And the affirmations is, you know, to really focus on the behaviors that led, Hey, you really prepared well for that game. You know, Uh, you really gave a great effort. Your focus was laser sharp, really focusing the behaviors and then to get them to reflect on, Hey, how did it feel to be out there today playing? Yeah. You know, three goals. That's incredible. You know, that it was, it must've felt really good. Can't have that every night, you know, to also lower expectations. Like it's great when you're on those nights, right? But what I love about you is that regardless of how well you're scoring, you give up, you know, you're going out there and you give great effort. So constantly reaffirming that individual of the behaviors that bring value to the team, not the outcomes, not the big scoring performance and to drop those expectations. Hey, we don't expect you to have a night like, you know, a 30 point night every night or, you know, score three, you know, three goals every night. Like what we do expect you is to, to bring that consistent effort to be a great teammate, you know, focus on those things. I think that, you know, ties into what you're talking about there of just helping players to focus on what they can control. And I think related to that, JP, is making that an ongoing conversation throughout the year, maybe in your individual meetings with players and just asking them, you know, what's the value that you bring to our team on the field or on the court separate from those outcomes? Whether you're shooting it great or you're shooting it poorly, how do you make us better? Right. And then just being able to appreciate them and share with them, here's what I see you doing that makes us better, even when your shots aren't falling, you know, and I think that that consistency of input, you know, to the things that we control that aren't necessarily determined by just points scored or something like that allows them to fortify in a sense, you know, their value and their worth and insulate it from exactly what you're talking about, right? The, the, the pressure and um, their identity being wrapped up just in their performance. The last question that I'd really encourage coaches to entertain with their team. And again, whether this is with their captains or in one-on-ones or as a, as a team discussion is really trying to get them to identify and appreciate what they enjoy most about being part of this team, whether they win or lose. And it's just another way to kind of tackle the same perspective here. But if it's fun because your team shares the ball, because everybody plays hard, because everybody celebrates each other, and we just love being together in the locker room, And that's not dependent on whether we win or lose, whether we play well or play poorly, just giving them that perspective and saying, okay, here's the things we're going to try to do to win tonight, but make sure that we don't miss this, you know, the opportunity to enjoy being part of this team and competing together. And as we get closer, everybody's getting closer to the postseason and the big games and the games that matter that become winner go home. 
that would be my biggest encouragement to coaches is getting your players to appreciate that and to enjoy it while it's still there. All right. Hopefully you found today's episode valuable. If you did, please support this podcast by first subscribing. Uh, secondly, sharing it, sharing on social media, um, share it, emailing it, text it out to, to friends and other coaches. And thirdly, by purchasing an online course, right? The money we make from the online courses helps us to continue producing this podcast and they help you. It also keeps us from having to run ads during the podcast for things like men's hair products or one of the other irrelevant companies who've reached out to be a sponsor of the podcast. I guess they think coaches have a hair loss problem and it'd be a great place to advertise. Anyways, thank you for listening in and supporting the podcast.